Hello everybody, good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Live at the Waterhole. And first up, we're in the Tembe Elephant Park in Maputaland of the KwaZulu-Natal province of South Africa. My name is Ralph Kirsten and what does the bush hold in store for us today? Well, you'll have to sit back, relax and watch as the animals come down to have a drink, quench their thirsts and cool off. Now, as per usual, please don't forget that this is a live and interactive experience. So we'd love for you to jump on board with us and send us through your questions and your comments. You can do that by going on the Wild Earth website and registering. You can also join the conversation on X, formerly known as Twitter, using the hashtag Wild Earth. What is it that you'd like to see? What would you like to chat about? Whatever it is, wildlife related, send it on through. As we see these two elephant bulls just saying hello to each other. With a little warthog grazing in the background. I always love this waterhole. Lots of elephant activity. And of course, there's been a huge weather system moving through KwaZulu Natal in the recent past, and there's been lots of flooding. And our thoughts do go out for everybody that's been affected in those parts of the country. It's came right up the east coast. And uh, But the worst has been in KwaZulu-Natal. So you can see there's a little bit of rain still in the background and it's quite dark and gloomy. And that's as a result of this big weather system with lots and lots of rain. So a couple of comments already coming through. Casper saying happy Tuesday from Milwaukee. Thank you, Wild Earth and Ralph. Looking forward to a wonderful waterhole safari and lovely to have you on board with us, Casper, all the way from Milwaukee. Wow. And Knight Ritz saying hello from the Netherlands. Jeepers. So we've got the Europeans on board with us as well. Welcome aboard, Knight Ritz. Joanne Mello saying good Tuesday, Wild Earth and Ralph. Absolutely, Joanne. Welcome aboard. As you see this elephant just doing a bit of a wheel spin. He's got lots of hair on his tail. You don't often see such a fluffy tail at the end of it. This guy's uh, looking good. Yeah, a little chin spot batters calling. He's kicking this dirt around. I think that's what that little wheel spin was about. I'm trying to get this dirt and the soil loosened up. some little blue wax bills that very high pitched call sounds like a yellow breasted apelus or a palus there's a drongo flitting about in the background The grey go away bird also calling in Afrikaans the queer fool because of the call. Very descriptive of the of, of the Afrikaans names because the grey go away bird does a real queer. That's why they call it a queer bird, queer fool. And 
Knight Ritz from the Netherlands. I'm sure you'll understand that. bit of sun now poking through and he's headed off into the shade So Bundu Bash saying hi Ralph, really enjoy your segments on Wild Earth. Well that's good to hear Bundu Bash and glad we have you on board once again. We can only wonder what's going to be going on today at the waterholes. Lovely start with these elephants here in the Tembe Elephant Park. Bull seems to be a little bit restless, almost like showing signs that he's be that he is in must. Is he gonna look for a fight with this tree? I'm going to look out for this bull in the future because we can uh, identify him by that really fluffy tail. We could call him Pom Pom.
I'm gonna log out and log back in again. Okay. Okay, should I try to logging out and logging back in? We have an exciting announcement. Wild Earth is launching a YouTube membership program. For a nominal monthly fee, members get an ad-free channel, prioritized questions, early access to videos, and many more perks. You'll get fun features like badges and emojis that'll make you stand out in the chat. YouTube memberships will help us to continue with our mission of connecting people with nature while giving you access to lots of our amazing content. which in time grew to the now 250 to 270 elephants that are found in the 30,000 hectare reserve today. And this large population of elephants pose a number of challenges for conservation. Their numbers are too many for the area they occupy and they're impacting on the biodiversity of the sensitive sand forest vegetation of Tembe Elephant Park, which forms part of the Maputaland Center of Plant Diversity and Endemism as declared in 1994 by the Worldwide Fund for Nature and World Conservation Union. Uh, Union. 
This distinctive forest type is known to be restricted to northern KwaZulu-Natal and southern Mozambique and has a unique combination of plant and animal species. Since the 1990s, Isenvelo KZN Wildlife have been working with the Mozambican government to re-establish the link between Tembe Elephant Park and the Makuto Special Reserve to restore the ancient migratory route of the elephants. And this forms part of the Greater Transfrontier Conservation Area plans for the region. This has been a slow process and as a holding mechanism to relieve pressure on the sand forest and control elephant numbers growing further, Wildland, Wildlands Conservation Trust has funded two management interventions in Tembe. A contraception program for the elephant restraining line that has been put in place protecting a 2,500 hectare area of sand forest. And look at that dark sky, the system that I was speaking of earlier. In May 2007, the first group of 82 female elephants was darted with a PZP contraception vaccine. The aim is to dart roughly 80 to 90 percent of the population in order to have 75 percent of the population on contraception. If a cow is already pregnant and is darted, the vaccine will not interfere with the pregnancy and the vaccine will not take any effect. In October 2007, a further 79 females were darted, and the process was repeated in October 2008 and October 2009. The slightly lower numbers needed to be darted in order to achieve a level of 75% of the population. With the gestation period of an elephant calf being around 22 months, many of the elephants darted may have been carrying and would not have been on contraception, but there are indications that there are now fewer calves. The elephant monitor and he tracks the breeding herds and gets identities for each animal, establishing the structure of the herd in order to establish when young are born. It will take a number of years before the full effect of the program is felt, which is why such close monitoring of the breeding herds is necessary. Trackers have been fitted to some of the elephant cows in order for breeding herds to be identified and monitored. Behavioral as well as habitat information is gathered this way. And the contraception program is not designed to decrease the number of elephants, but to control further growth in the population. Dr. Ruli Kloppers, manager of the Biodiversity Management Support Program for Wildlands Conservation Trust, said the work we funded in Tembe Elephant Park represents one of a series of pioneering and groundbreaking e ecological interventions supported by the Trust. We aim to support the scientific community in developing new insights into elephant management that could be duplicated throughout the region. At this stage, the results are very encouraging and the feedback we have received illustrates the value of supporting scientific input into advancing the management of biodiversity. Not only is the contraception program helping to manage elephant numbers as a holding mechanism for later expansion of the range when the population can be allowed to grow, biodiversity conservation objective of reducing the effect of the elephant population on the sand forests in Tembe is being achieved. Vegetation, animal and bird surveys are yet to be completed for exact results to be established, but it is clear that the sand forest is making a recovery from the damage caused by the elephants. So I think that there's not a real rehabilitation per se of the elephants. Um, it's obviously a conservation initiative to predict this particular population of elephants and hopefully in the future they'll be able to re-establish these migratory routes between South Africa and Mozambique. Right, so now that the elephants have moved off and the sky is getting darker, it's getting a bit scary, I think we'll move off and we'll head to the Madikwe Game Reserve and Africa M Tau. With a couple of quite large crocodilians here on the edge of the waterhole. Good to see them out of the water. Often struggle to see them. But uh, today they're nice and visible.
So a comment coming through from Lorraine, who was appreciating the information on the Tembi elephants. Thanks, Lorraine. Nice that you're enjoying it. So and Joanne Mello saying that uh, the crocs are her favorite. So glad we could show you. It's not every time that we get to see them here at Tau. And we often get questions around their coloration and why you have some that are darker, some that are lighter. There's a little bit of conflicting information regarding this. But it does come down to that a lot of reptiles are able to change their colors according to their thermoregulation requirements. So whether they're very hot um, and they've got enough energy from the sun then they'll normally turn themselves a lighter color to enable reflection of the heat and not absorbing of it and then the darker ones it could also be you know just at that stage and the particular requirements at the time that they are actually still absorbing the heat um, as they are ectothermic organisms and so getting their energy from external sources so once they start turning a bit darker, they, um, they're trying to absorb more. Um, and as they get that, then they can turn a bit lighter. But uh, there is also that that helps them for camouflage, of course. But generally, the juveniles of the Nile crocodile, which was the only species of crocodile that occurs in Africa, and the ones that we're viewing here, um, are gray. So the juveniles are gray, multicolored, or brown. And there's these two are not juvenile at all they're, they're fully grown um, they, they can still grow more but um, and they're both different colors so it for me wouldn't be that one is really much younger than the other they look of similar age um, but they do have dark cross bands on the tail and body and the underbelly of young crocodiles is yellowish green as they mature now crocodiles become darker on the cross bands especially those on the upper body and a similar tendency in coloration change during maturation has been noted in species so i think less so um, with other species um, or should i say with a nile crocodile just changing um, because of the thermoregulation requirements but they still do do it so in my mind the difference in coloration here is just that these two individuals have got different thermoregulation requirements and maybe the one in the foreground came out of the water later than the one that had probably been basking itself in the sun and already achieved the requirements um, for therm thermoregulation and hence why it's turned a bit of a lighter color Now here's a couple of very interesting facts about the Nile crocodile. Um, this is from Wikipedia and they say that most morphological attributes of Nile crocodiles are typical of crocodilians as a whole. Like all crocodilians, for example, the Nile crocodile is a quadruped with four short splayed legs, a long powerful tail, a scaly hide with rows of ossified scutes running down its back and tail, and powerful elongated jaws. Their skin has a number of poorly understood inter integumentary sense organs that may react to changes in water pressure, presumably allowing them to track prey movements in the water. Something I would think similar to the lateral line, uh, like a lot of predatory fish, which are able to pick up vibrations in the water as well. 
and the Nile crocodile has fewer osteoderms on the belly, which are much more conspicuous on some of the more modestly sized crocodilians. The species, however, also has small oval osteoderms on the side of the body as well as the throat. And the Nile crocodile shares with all crocodilians a nictitating membrane to protect the eyes and lacrimal glands to cleanse its eyes with tears. The nostrils, eyes and ears are situated on the top of the head so the rest of the body can remain concealed under the water. They have a four-chambered heart. Although modified for their ectothermic nature due to an elongated cardiac septum, physiologically similar to the heart of a bird, which is especially efficient at oxygenating their blood. As in all crocodilians, Nile crocodiles have exceptionally high levels of lactic acid in their blood, which allows them to sit motionless in water for up to two hours. Levels of lactic acid as high as they are in a crocodile would kill most vertebrates. However, exertion by crocodilians can lead to death due to increasing lactic ethyl levels, which in turn leads to failure of the animal's internal organs. This is rarely recorded in wild crocodiles, normally having been observed in cases where humans have mishandled crocodiles and put them through overly extended periods of physical struggling and stress. There's definitely nothing stressful about these two. And as I think we'll probably be able to come back here and see these crocodiles, I don't think they're going to be moving anywhere anytime soon. So let's move off and this time let's head to Zimbabwe and Vic Falls. Completely different environment here few clouds around but the sun is burning down and we've got some marabou storks they uh, have probably just had their lunchtime meal at the lodge at the vulture restaurant and now comes through here for a drink looks like there might be some white-faced ducks in the background there is that a gray heron off to the left And here's some guinea fowl calling. A vulture also heading in for a drink there.
So the marabou stalk is um, part of the ugly five. And there's a nice little write-up by storyteller.travel. Uh, speaking of facts about the ugly marabou stalk, I suppose uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But it is considered to be one of the ugliest animals on the planet. Beneath its homely exterior, the marabou stork is also one of the most fascinating birds found on Earth. We do call them the undertaker because of its appearance. When seen from behind, the marabou stork's backs and wings appear cloak-like. Its legs are skinny and white and sometimes there's a white tuft of what appears to be hair on its head. It has a 12-foot wingspan, standing an average of 60 inches tall and weighing in at approximately 20 pounds. So what would that be? Just less than 10 kilograms. The marabou's wingspan of 12 feet is amongst the largest of any bird that is alive today, after the wandering albatross and great white pelican. And the female marabou stork is smaller than the male counterpart. Other than that, the male and female marabou stork look exactly alike. And each have a large bill, a pink goulash sack near the throat, and a neck ruff. So we're just getting a different view there. Same place. And we can just see there's some, a nice little group of kudu here as well joining the marabou storks and the white-backed vulture. Looks like a hooded vulture there as well, off to the right of the... So native to tropical Africa, the marabou stork can be found in the wilds of Senegal, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, Namibia, South Africa and Uganda. And it can most often be spotted near wetlands or in semi-arid savannas in grasslands. Here's something interesting. Even though the marabou stork doesn't have a voice box, it can make some sound by using its throat pouch or by clattering its bills together. When it's making a social display, the marabou can produce a loud croaking sound by using its throat pouch and it will clap its bill together to show it's feeling threatened. And we've seen that at the Vulture restaurant, obviously trying to be intimidating more so than being threatened, I think. And there's also been reports of the marabou producing moos, whines, whistles and even hiccups when courting and when feeling threatened as well. Marabou storks are drawn to grass fires, much like uh, egrets are, uh, like a moth to a flame. They fly ahead of the flames and swoop down on small animals that are fleeing the blaze. So, a very opportunistic animal as well. Something uglier, something cool, but to cool down, the marabou stork squirts excrement on its legs giving them their white appearance. But that's not the only way the marabou keeps cool in the African heat. Similar to many birds, the marabou stalk also pants as a way to lower its body temperature when it gets too hot. To get warm, the marabou stalk spreads out its wings to take in the warming rays of the sun. The marabou stork can also be called one of the laziest birds there is because it normally does not expend any energy unnecessarily. Well, why would you? The marabou stork spends most of its time simply standing around. Like many of its stork brothers and sisters, the marabou hunches over with its tarsi flat on the ground. The marabou is not an especially proficient flyer. Like other storks, it flies with its legs flowing out from behind its body, 
but that is where the similarity ends. Unlike their cousins, when in flight, the marabou tucks its neck in to form a flattened S, and this permits the weight of its beak to be borne on its shoulders, whereas other storks fly with their necks extended straight out. When they breed during dry season, when water levels are lower, meaning that birds and fish are easier to both find and catch, which is quite dissimilar from a lot of the other animals when where they breed when the resources are at their maximum. And during the breeding season, marabous gather in groups ranging anywhere from 20 pairs to upwards of several thousand. And the male stakes out his territory and inflates his throat pouch when newcomers arrive. He will then pair up with a courting female who enters his territory and nest building begins. The pair usually mates for life and will construct their nest out of sticks on the side of a cliff in a tree or even on top of a building. Two to three eggs will be laid in the nest with a two to three day between each laying. Both male and female marabou help to incubate the eggs. So that's a very good couple. It takes about a month for the eggs to hatch and when they do they covered in a down that is grey coloured. Both sexes will also tend to feed their young. Only one of the three chicks will make it to the fledge stage 13 to 15 weeks after a hatch. As we see these beautiful disruptive markings on these female kudu, those white stripes meant to break up the outline of their body when they're in their favored environment, which is in the thickets, in the bush. It's so difficult for the predators to make out and catch them, really. You can see that they are potentially performing geophagia here, where this lighter colored soil is next to this water hole. There's probably mineral salts there. We do see this around a lot of the water holes where the animals go and lick the ground, getting in their supplements. on safari.
So just a request to please join our YouTube membership program. There's some great benefits. The best one being an ad free stream that you can rewind and pause. You can go to our YouTube channel and click join to find out more. This is a really simple process. And if you're on DSTV, think about coming across to YouTube for an ad free experience for a fraction of the cost. All relatively new smart TVs have the YouTube app. So I do say that it's probably a good idea. All right, so a nice stop in here with the undertakers and the vultures and the small family of Kudu. And I think to change of ties, and let's head back to Tao. Where I'm pretty sure they've started to refill this water hole. It was getting quite badly empty, and there seems to be quite a bit more water. And with that, we've got a lovely group of zebra that are bringing us all the stripes. So I was speaking of the natural wonders of the world a little bit earlier at Vic Falls. Do you know what are the seven natural wonders of the world? And I'm going to tell you. Aurora or the northern lights in the Earth's high latitude regions around the Arctic and Antarctic. The Grand Canyon which is in Arizona in the United States. The Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Queensland, Australia. The harbour of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Mount Everest on the border of Nepal and China, Parukuten volcano located in the state, state of Michoacan, Mexico, and Victoria Falls on the border of Zambia and Zimbabwe. I do believe that they've now made it eight natural wonders of the world, adding um, Niagara Falls in from the US, but this was the original Victoria Falls being the largest and most water falling over any waterfall, uh, waterfall on the planet. Seems to be quite a little bit grey here at Town Quick Game Reserve. I really do hope they get some of the rain. This country needs it more than anywhere else, so that we can only hope. So Hannah was asking, is this where the crocodiles are? Are the zebbies in danger? Well, generally, Hannah, um, thanks for your question, firstly. And secondly, the way that the elephants were sort of out of uh, the elephants, the crocodiles were sort of out of the water like that, sunning themselves, generally means that they're not hunting. They're, uh, they're just sunning themselves. They've exposed themselves, and so they can be seen by all the prey species. These zebra aren't close to them. They're on the other side of the waterhole, per se, off to the left, where the crocodiles are probably about 50 meters or so away from them, at least. Um, but like I say, with them being exposed like that, they're not going to be hunting. They're just get the, getting the energy required to potentially hunt. 
So once they go back in the water is when they become dangerous. So if I can see a crocodile, I'm happy. It's when I can't see them and I know that there are crocodile in the water that I get worried. So this is most likely also just one harem of zebra with one male and potentially a few females. They generally have, you know, between six and ten females in one harem. Anything more than that, and it's difficult for us to actually keep the females within the group because there will be other males trying to steal his females. So generally a manageable size, as I say, is between six and ten, but more so six or seven. Is probably optimal. Anything more, and he starts losing them to other males. Experience captivating wildlife documentaries showcasing incredible animal behavior for free by visiting lionmountain.tv or downloading the app accessible on both Apple and Android platforms. Just around and see what else is about. There's a couple of black wing stilts just in the foreground there, feeding on the banks of this water hole. Sounds like some red billed buffalo weavers chatting away. There was a blacksmith lapwing there, looks like a 
water thickney. Seems to be some Egyptian geese foraging in the water. Couple of Natal spurfowl now making a racket. Here's a little common moor hen. A little bit quiet today especially in terms of elephants we've seen a lot of activity especially around this time of the day maybe it's a little bit cooler here in these parts today and so they're not being driven down to the water as much as they usually are And once again, the little back spills calling here somewhere near to this camera. Very high pitch, pitch squeaky call. Right, so you can see that kudu bull off in the bush line there, but he's not exposing himself. We'll keep an eye on him. I think it's time to change of place. Let's go to the Greater Kruger Park and my Lady Dam. I really like this water hole. Often having the elephants coming in to drink here and the little pond on the right and then having a lovely splash. In the water hole on the left. It's a bit quiet for now, but you never know. Alright, so now that it's a little bit quiet here, I think it's time for us to go and have a look at some of the highlights of the last 24 hours in this exact spot. So obviously during the night, The lions came to visit. And these females look like they're having a bit of a game. Youngster wanting to join in. And I think it's a little bit uh, scared, would it be? And the adults are getting played out.
what a lovely sighting this is. Lots of playful behavior. Three, another youngster. Two adult females and a younger one. So, what a lovely little sighting that was overnight with the Lions at Naledi Dam. But we've returned back to the Madikwe Game Reserve, and there's not much happening at Naledi for now. But we'll keep an eye on it. We never do know. I'm wondering where that kudu's moved off to. Aha! There he comes. What a specimen. The kudu generally like staying even within just in the confines of the thickets and the bush. They prefer that. They're a lot more agile in that kind of environment. And they're not quite comfortable out in the open. They do prefer to be back in the thickets. And a great go away bird calling again. So, and to me, this area around the waterhole showing signs of the likes of Calcrete, quite similar to that of Itosha. So my thinking would be that historically, you know, this is sedimentary rocks, if I'm not mistaken, and this could have been quite a big water hole at some stage, and then lots of sediments, and sediments would turn into sedimentary rocks later, and so I think that there was a lot more water here at some stage in the distant past. Just slowly and gracefully walking, I think, to get towards the water hole. Where the water's a little bit deeper towards where the zebra were. A little bit of sun about, just now shining on this kudu.
Looks like he's found himself something to feed on there. There seems a bit of greenery. There has been a little bit of rain about in the recent past. Hasn't been anything major, but in this semi-arid environment, it, it reacts so quickly to any kind of moisture and little rain. So that's that new growth we're seeing. And now it looks like he might attack the termite mound. So Pink Ellie was saying, look how thick his neck is. Absolutely, he is a beast. And Lincoln, 1800, saying beautiful kudu. Absolutely, they are very gracious. And in my mind, some people would differ, but I would say second only to the Gemsbok, or the Oryx. And the zebra in the background have a bit of a joust with their back legs kicking at each other. Sandy Franklin, 69, saying, oh, how cute. All of that and more, as the kudu now feels a little bit uncomfortable, as I suggested, being out in the open, maybe heading to where he feels a little bit better in the thickets. Oh, how time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Wild Earth is turning 17 and we want to make the years count. 17 years of achievements, close encounters and special memories. He's got it, he's got it and he's straight up a tree. Come along as we reflect on our top 17 greatest moments. Here's to more years of connecting you to nature. Wild Earth, connecting with nature.
Right, so all these zebra are just slowly disappearing behind the dam wall. I think we'll take another little tour of the area. Maybe see what's happening with the crocodiles. Are they still sunning themselves? Or have they made their way into the water? The ever-present blacksmith lapwings. Looks like there's a three-banded plover and then a black winged stilt. Now, as interesting as these crocodiles are, they're obviously not moving at all. They always look like they're smiling with their teeth exposed outside. But just behind them, you can see that little brown stalky plant. There's actually been quite a lot of it that I've seen on the banks of this waterhole just recently. They've got quite a big seed pod. And this is actually Datura stramonium. It's, um, it's also known by the common names of thorn apple, jimson weed, devil's snare, or even devil's trumpet. It's a poisonous flowering plant of the nightshade family. It's a species belonging to the Datura genus. Its likely origin is from Central America. It's been introduced into many world regions. It's an aggressive, invasive weed in temperate climates and tropical climates across the world. And it's been frequently employed in traditional med medicine to treat a variety of ailments. It's also been used as a, as a hallucinant um, of the anti-colonogenic, anti-muscanoric type taken entheogenically to cause intense sacred or occult visions. And it's unlikely ever to become a major drug of abuse owing to effects upon both mind and body frequently perceived as being highly unpleasant giving rise to a state of profound and long-lasting disorientation or delirium with a potentially fatal outcome so it contains tropone tropane alkaloids which are responsible for the psychoactive effects and may be severely toxic locally known in south africa as malpita because of the war, they used to take it up on the Angolan border and it literally used to drive some of the soldiers mad. So in Afrikaans, mul meaning mad and pitta meaning seed, so it's the mad seed plant as it is known locally. So Kelly H was asking, when they're resting like this, do they stop breathing? I wouldn't say that they stop altogether, Kelly H, but they will definitely not be breathing much. We, you know, crocodiles can hold their breath for 15 to 30 minutes at a time. Um, and when they're not active, they're, obviously their heart rate does reduce and they don't breathe much as well. 
So they can seem almost dead, but I promise you that's not the case, as one has just opened its eye now and had a look at us. Alright, so these crocodiles still haven't moved anywhere, and I'm pretty sure they're not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. So let's change of place, and let's go right down to the tip of Africa and Stony Point. With a couple of the elephant's closest relative. The rock hyrax, or dussies, sunning themselves out on the rocks. Now many guests and viewers are often astounded that this is in fact a relative of the elephant and one of the close relatives of the elephant. Beyond the realms of elephants, their family tree takes a surprising twist. There's two marine herbivores, the dugongs and the manatees, that share a, a remarkable kinship with elephants and are elephants' closest relatives. These aquatic mammals boast impressively lengthy lifespans of up to 70 years. Employ prehensile lips akin to an elephant's trunk to forage on the sea floor. Moreover, the elephant family's most astonishing relatives can be found much closer in geographical terms to the African elephant. Enter the hyrax, a small mammal resembling a sizable guinea pig. The furry creatures diverged from elephants around the same era as dugongs and manatees around 60 million years ago. Hyraxes are widespread across Africa, inhabiting trees and rocky outcrops. They share numerous striking similarities with their colossal colors, cousins, from similar teeth and toe structures to skull shapes. And in a remarkable parallel, Hyraxes have even developed small tusks stemming from their incisors. Both species exhibit internal testes, experience extended gestation periods, and boast highly developed long-term memory. So Germain was saying, that's a strange name, Hyrax. It is indeed Germain. And a lot of the Latin names um, or scientific names are quite strange. Until you look them up and you see a lot of them derived from Latin or sometimes even from Greek. And that's in this case from the Hyrax. It is actually from ancient Greek. Hurax, which means a shrew mouse. So now we know 
why it's called that. And they often use these Greek or Latin names because it's very neutral across the world. Um, and so there's not a fight whether to make it English, French, or um, any of the Germanic languages. Everybody. rocks on the beach. The western tree hyrax, the southern tree hyrax, the eastern tree hyrax and the Benin tree hyrax. But their distribution is all limited to Africa. Except for the rock hyrax which is also found in the Middle East. So from sleeping crocodiles to sleeping hyraxes, I think we'll try and find some action. So let's go back to the Greater Kruger Park and Olifants River. Now sleeping crocodiles, sleeping hyrax and sleepy hippos. So it's a sleepy Tuesday afternoon. And that's obviously an indication of the temperature in the area. It's obviously a little bit cooler than normal, hence the hippos being out of the water, trying to warm up. Not very good at thermoregulating, hence the reason why they're in and out of the water, helping to externally assist with the regular problem. A couple of ox peckers on the back of the sleeping hippo looking for those wounds. They don't generally have ticks on them and so the ox peckers come just to parasitize on the hippos. So you could say that generally the ox peckers are actually parasites of hippos and um, they do assist the other animals that they're on 
and from the giraffe to kudu and zebra and impala and the rest only when they do have an open wound will they keep it open but generally just feeding on the ticks being sanguinivores and actually after the blood that the ticks have engorged themselves with a little bit of a yawn there from this hippo that was a yawn that wasn't a display and they really open their mouths and show off their tusks Now, Busy B sent through a comment that's really interesting for me, uh, referring back to the mull pitta uh, that I was speaking of earlier, the datura or the devil's snares. And Busy B saying the devil's snare features in the first Harry Potter film. I'll actually have to go and have a look at that. Probably, I would think, around the hallucinogenic properties of that particular plant, surely. So, and cheetahs and other animals saying this is the world's largest sleepover. Absolutely. You couldn't get much bigger than that. Is that a little youngster or is it a rock next to this standing adult? I'm still not a hundred percent sure but I'm now leaning towards a rock. Very smooth rock being next to the river. It would have been uh, washed smooth by the water itself. But look very much like a little hippo. I think it is indeed a rock, but I'm not... No, it isn't. It is a youngster. Now I can see the shape of its head looking straight at us. Little ears out the side. If that isn't a hippo, it's the most hippo-like rock I've ever seen. So we often get asked what is the closest relative to a hippo and if you look at whales you might have a hard time figuring out where they fit into the mammalian family tree and in fact hippopotamuses are actually whales closest cousins they're much more closely related than you might guess based on their fossil records scientists have determined that whales are related to land dwelling mammals that lived on Earth between 52 and 47 million years ago. These early whales were well adapted to coastal habitats and over time were slowly able to transition to the fully marine whales we recognize today. The first whale that we know of doesn't really look anything like a whale at all. This first, the first ancient whale's name is a Pachycetus, which lived entirely on land but was well it much like dogs or bears. Interestingly, in 1859, Charles Darwin related a scene of a swimming bear catching insects in the water to that of a whale catching its food and even alluded to the possibility of a bear-like creature being rendered by natural selection increasingly marine, eventually giving rise to something such as a whale.
So the process of natural selection works over time to better animals' traits to their environments by having higher survival rates amongst the animals that have the more adaptive trait. Natural selection, however, can't act on a trait which doesn't already exist. A much smaller level of natural selection can be seen in the coloration of deer mice in the sandals of Nebraska. They develop two very distinct colors based on which environment they are living in within the same general area. Depending on the color of the soil where they live, they have adapted a color in which they are the most camouflaged from predators. The mice with dark coats has a better chance of survival on the dark soil, and the mice with the light colored coats had a better chance of survival on the light soil, thus becoming two distinct populations. Within just 8,000 years, this change has already altered their DNA by a single gene. And the differences in these populations could grow to become even more distinct. So like with the deer mice of Nebraska, natural selection slowly shaped the ancient ancestors of whales to become increasingly adapted to their habitat. While Pachycetus was bear-like, Ambulo Ambulocetus, with big feet, thicker thighs and a tail more suitable for swimming, looked much like a furry alligator. Oopsie, what's startled this little youngster now? Woken him up. So this creature, the Ambulocetus, was still living on land but was also quite comfortable and lived between 48 to 41 million years ago. Cachycetus, another ancient whale relative, was entirely marine and it had a flat tail that it would have used to swim by moving up and down. Most strikingly, this animal's snout was elongated with its nostrils on top to allow its body to be mostly submerged while still able to breathe. Similarly, the creature's eyes were also located near the top of its head in order to, to see near the shore while its body was underwater. And these adaptations are seen in a wide variety of aquatic and marine animals today as well. The Myocetus and the Duradon are two final examples that show us ancient whales fully adapted to marine life. Find limbs separated from their spinal column, they were unable to support weight on land. Myocetus and Dorudon had ear bones much better adapted to hearing underwater, as well as teeth and jaws more adapted to gripping and slicing their prey. But what do all of these ancient creatures have in common with modern whales and hippos? In the late 1700s first noticed similarities between whales and hippos through their reproductive organs, but thought they were intel. It wasn't until the 1980s when the skeleton of Pachycetus was first discovered, containing remnants of bones found only in whales, the Cetacea, and even toed hoofed mammals, or the Arteodactyla, such as camels, pigs, and giraffe. And the ear, ear bone in Pachycetus contains two unique features that are found in Cetacea and Arteodactyla, the involucrum and a sigmoid process responsible for allowing whales to hear underwater. Pachycetus' skeleton also contained a uniquely shaped ankle bone containing a double pulley feature only seen elsewhere in even-toed hoofed mammals, but not found in odd-toed hoofed mammals such as horses or rhinos. More recently, modern science allowed for even further developments in this fantastic detective story a DNA research study into the relationship between whales and even toed hoofed mammals revealed that do in fact share similar gene sequences with the Arteodactyla. Furthermore, the DNA testing revealed that whales share DNA sequence found only in one other animal, indicating that among all the non-whale mammals alive today, whales' closest living relatives are none other than the hippopotamus. The transformation of animals like Pachycetus into animals like Duradon is a truly phenomenal tale, as the process of natural selection took a mere 10 million years. Though that may seem like a very long time from a human perspective, it's virtually a blink of an eye in the history of our planet. For an animal that looks like a bear or wolf to give rise to something as dramatically different as a whale, in such a comparatively short period of time, is one of the most remarkable transformations witnessed in the fossil records. Natural selection was working in overdrive when it comes to whales and hippos.
Right, so nice to see this little youngster here. Not nice to see him being startled, but nonetheless, he's gone back for a sleep. And he's not the only youngster that's been around this killer spot in the recent past. Let's go and look at some of the highlights of this area. Also at night, I think uh, maybe on the other side of the river itself, a little baby with its roosting mom, keeping her up, I think. I'm not going to get much sleep tonight. How cute is that? A very caring mom. And there she's drifting off back to sleep. Although she's trying to, maybe that youngster's got colic. So we've left the Olifans River and the sleep beam last night to today, being the hippos and the baboons overnight. And back here at Victoria Lodge, it is now a number of uh, a number of more marabou storks that have arrived. And you see this one, as I was speaking earlier, seemingly trying to warm up. Maybe it's been for a little bit of a bath in the water, so trying to dry its wings. But I would think. And that's an attempt to actually warm up. Maybe it's a little bit cooler here than it has been. And you can see what I was talking about, that 12 foot wingspan. They've got a huge wingspan, have the marabou storks. And there comes a little egret, and there's also a yellow billed stork there as well. Cedric's probably going to fall that one.
So there you can also see that incredible neck or gular sort of um, flap area on the marabou stalk. As mentioned, those helicopters are all part of the activities to see the Victoria Falls fly, and they pretty much work from sunrise to sunset. There goes two. And they're also taken to the sky. Yeah, he started a trend. How many more are going to join? There goes another one thinking about it. No, not just yet. They do need a little bit of a runway. There we go. There's another. Off he goes. And there is a run rate required both for takeoff and for landing. Another one coming in on the opposite bank. And that's something always to remember with big birds like this, vultures, marabou storks and the likes, and even big predatory birds, eagles, etc. On cold days, it's important not to, you know, as far as you can, not to disturb them when they're roosting on top of sometimes dead trees, etc. Because they've got quite heavy bodies, they've got big bodies, and it's not as easy for them to fly as it is with little birds. They just take to the wing, just by one little jump, and off they go. Obviously with a much bigger weight, um, you know, they have to expend a lot more energy. And so they prefer to fly when it's very hot, because then they catch the thermals, and they just, um, you know, circle around in those thermals, and that's how they, they gain height. When it's cold, there aren't really any thermals, so they need to physically beat their wings, exerting a lot of energy and burning up a lot of calories um, to get up into the sky. So if you can help it, try not to disturb big predatory birds or the likes of big storks, um, secretary birds, uh, and the rest, if you can help it, because you will then at least help them co to conserve the very important energy that they have. You don't know when they're going to get their next meal. So with them burning off that energy just to get away from you, um, you know, they might uh, put themselves in a bad position. So if you are that kind of person, try not to chase the birds if you can. So Dark Mane Lover was saying I love those wings. They are massive, aren't they? Dark Mane Lover, nice to have you on board once again. And Benji saying quite eerie with all those uh, undertakers. Yeah, it's almost like we're at a funeral procession here. And ants saying that must be where they carry the babies for delivery with that big neck. Yeah, absolutely. But I think it's white storks. I wouldn't like to be delivered as a baby by a marabou stork. I think that would bring with it a lot of omens, if you believe in that kind of thing. 
Um, and Gail asking, will flocks only consist of their own kind? Gail, um, not Fancy playing safari snaps? Or showing off your photo skills in fun competitions? How about sneak peeks of our brand new camera spots? and live chats with fellow AFRICAM fans. Well, AFRICAM All Access has got your back. Just head to AFRICAM's YouTube channel, hit the join button and select AFRICAM All Access. You'll unlock AFRICAM premium website perks and all the VIP benefits of our YouTube memberships. It's just a different camera now looking more down on these birds we changed the other way around a little bit earlier we went from up to down low this time from down low to up top All right, so here at one of the natural wonders of the world, we've enjoyed watching these marabou stalks, but I think we're going to head right back down into South Africa, down into the Eastern Cape and Flodge.
with just the remnants of the clouds and the system that's now moved up into KwaZulu Natal. This is what's left over of it, and just the back end of that system itself. So if you're wondering where this is, there's just a springbok walking through there in the background, which is um, probably the most eastern sort of natural populations of, of springbok here in these parts. Um, from here into the Kru and then all the way up um, into the northern Cape and then into Namibia. This is the real natural um, geographical populations of, of springbok. Otherwise, it's too wet for them. So they don't do as well here as they may do in those drier parts. So anyway, this is between Kobecha, the old Port Elizabeth, and Grahamstown, and hopefully we'll come here quite a lot more in the future. But that being said, I think this and it's head to King's Camp. We've got a southern giraffe. Looks like a bull feeding off on the acacia thickets. Now known as the chilia. There seems to be some kind of little wind turbine off to the left of this giraffe. Maybe helping to keep um, the electric wires or the little water hole or whatever it is going. It's obviously turning some kind of turbine. Towards the end of the show, it's gone by in a really enjoyed today's show. It wasn't as active, especially from the elephant's perspective, but um, today was quite interesting from our side. Enjoyed it. And I hope you join us again once more tomorrow for another live at the waterhole. As always, we say thanks to the wildlife for being the stars without them what could be be watching and for you the viewers for joining us once more without you there wouldn't be a show either so then we get to the wild earth crew and um, I have to say thanks to, to all of you as well because without them there wouldn't be anything either so the three of you thank you so much and we will see you again next time give it horns bush greetings cheers for now everybody